Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. I extend a warm welcome to the participants on uh, the Saturday evening for a webinar on uh, aging with uh, HIV. Today, 5th June has a significance. Almost uh, four decades back on this day, the first HIV case has been diagnosed in the US. In view of this key development, 5th June has been observed the world over as long-term HIV survivors day. Well, that's a significant achievement, I must say. Those who have seen the initial stages of the disease and what we are today, we have moved from HIV AIDS being a death sentence to a chronic manageable disease. But the entire thing has not happened over a night. A lot of efforts had went into in achieving this particular success. Well, the initial few decades were dedicated in terms of controlling the spread of HIV disease and also in developing potent antiretroviral drugs. The next few decades have been dedicated for enhancing access of this potent antiretroviral drugs to the developing nations and also providing a good quality of life to the people living with HIV. In fact, India has made an enormous contribution in the overall management of HIV AIDS disease globally. The majority of antiretroviral drugs that has been supplied for these developing nations, whether uh, are either sourced or developed from India and supplied to these countries. Even Hetero has made a major contribution in the overall management of HIV AIDS. Even as one today, as we can, as we it caters to almost one third of the HIV AIDS formulations or APIs that the world has required. In India, if you look at it, we had the we have the third highest disease burden of HIV AIDS. But despite oh. those numbers, but despite those numbers, I think even we have made a tremendous progress in ensuring that the new numbers are plateaued as on date. Of course, this has come through tremendous work and collaboration of various government agencies and the clinicians and the pharmaceutical industry. So today, if you look at it, if people are living a long and healthy lives, it is primarily because of the successful efforts and initiatives taken by various clinicians and the key people associated with HIV AIDS management in India. And considering that you now PLH are going to live a longer and healthy life, it is imperative for most of our clinicians to understand the aging with HIV AIDS. And to deliberate on this particular topic, we have some of the best faculty today to give their entire viewpoints in terms of how we can approach this particular period of HIV AIDS management. And the faculty, what we have today, have been associated with HIV AIDS management from the initial stages of this disease uh, entry or diagnosis in India, I must say. So with that uh, brief introduction, I'm glad to introduce our moderator today, that is Dr. Vinay Kulkarni. Can you have the slide, please? So Dr. Vinay Kulkarni is a honorary consultant in Dinanath Mangeshkar Hospital and a chief clinician at uh, Praya Samruta Clinic. He is also a coordinator to Praya's health group, which has been catering to a lot of patients and also doing a lot of uh, projects under uh, Government of India. Dr. Vinay Kulkarni, to his credit, has published over 63 papers and has authored six chapters and he has edited four books as well. 
He has presented over 100 lectures in various national and international forums. Apart from various awards, he has been honored with IADBL Oration Award in the Democon in Bangalore 2019. Dr. Venikulkarni's special interest is in critical dermatology, basic tuberculosis, dermatosis, HIV, and sexually transmitted diseases and their epidemiology. So with this brief introduction, I'm glad to welcome our moderator, Dr. Vinay Kulkar. Hello, uh, good evening. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, am yes, I audible? Sir. Yeah, okay. So good evening and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I, on a very lighter note, uh, someone showed me my CV slide and uh, if you are seeing me now, it is aging with the HIV and epidemic kind of a thing, you know, you are looking, I, I'm looking quite young there in the photograph. So it must have been a very old photograph. Uh, today it's exactly 40 years uh, since the disease was reported in the US and uh, we have come a long way and uh, as you rightly said, uh, we are from the first generation of clinicians in India, probably, who started dealing with HIV a long time back. And uh, many of our patients aging with HIV right now who are coming to the clinic, if we look at the uh, mean age of the people, uh, about 25 years ago, it would have been around 30, 35. Now it is around 40, 45. So almost the whole generation of HIV infected people is kind of aging. And if you are talking to them now, uh, 20 in 2021 or in 2022, if you talk to them, uh, they are so kind of overwhelmed this fact that in 2000 or in nine, late 1990s or something, if they were diagnosed with HIV, no one ex had expected that this day would come in their life, even after starting the treatment, because even if we were offering them the treatment, no one knew exactly at that time that how long it is going to work. Uh, so the, that time, at least we were not telling them that you're going to survive for another 25, 30 years. We were saying that, yes, this is the best thing that has happened to you and uh, it is going to help you. But now that we have people, the oldest of my patient, I have my records, is, was diagnosed in 1990 and is still doing fine. And so um, surviving patient. And that is what has exactly changed. Now, before we go to the presentations on aging and HIV, I think uh, because we are in COVID pandemic also, we have some lessons to learn from that pandemic, uh, that epidemic and pandemic of HIV, which started about 40 years back. And apart from the medical advances, what I feel, feel is that uh, HIV epidemic has actually taught us a lot about uh, people's participation, community participation, community engagement and community uh, solidification as well as uh, unless the communities are involved in the fighting with the disease we cannot conquer any of the epidemics that has that was taught to us by uh, the HIV epidemic management and I think we are going to learn a lot we have implemented that in managing COVID and the COVID pandemic is going to teach us furthermore that how we have to engage and improve our public health systems and how do we approach the health systems etc. So these are my views on the kind of a cusp of 40 years of uh, uh, HIV epidemic and now in the second year of COVID pandemic. So before wasting any more time, I would like to uh, introduce our first speaker, Sanjay Pujari. And uh, I would be introducing Dr. Ganga Khedkar later, but uh, I must tell you that uh, for last 25 years at least, uh, Today's two speakers are the ones, if they are talking, I would make it a point to attend to their presentation because we always learn something new from them. And these are my most uh, listened to speakers. Uh, Sanjay and uh, Dr. Ganga Khedkar also, we know each other for a very long time because we have been in this uh, epidemic for a very long time. So Sanjay is basically the director and chief consultant at Institute of Infectious Diseases in Pune. Uh, he was also he's a member of ICMR National Task Force on COVID. Uh, he has been involved in care, research, and training. And uh, his probably his interest has shifted not only from HIV, which was initially there, to all infectious diseases now. 
and uh, he is the chief investigator at Pune site of Treat Asia HIV observational database. He has been training uh, people all over the world. He has been a faculty at the European AIDS Con Clinical Society's HIV advanced courses. And he has presented and published numerous papers and uh, with specific uh, interest in antiretroviral treatment trials, etc. So over to Sanjay. Uh, I would be eagerly waiting for your presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, can I share my screen? Okay. Okay, thank you Vinay for that uh, introduction and it's really quite nostalgic that we are in 40 years since the epidemic was first described uh, in the US and really we have come a long way in uh, trying to not only learn from this epidemic but you know uh, trying to um, kind of develop our own models of uh, management uh, which have which are more uh, kind of uh, resource uh, less resource intensive so uh, as far as aging and hiv is concerned i thought uh, i would focus on three areas first is of course show you what are the numbers of uh, people uh, who are aging with HIV, both globally as well as uh, in India and uh, in our own setups. Then we'll briefly dis discuss some issues of uh, antiretroviral uh, um, uh, problems in elderly uh, people living with HIV. And finally, I will give you some uh, management hints on uh, selected comorbidities or what are called as non-AIDS defining events. Uh, particularly which are common in uh, elderly um, uh, HIV infected individuals. So we all know this, this is the global AIDS report uh, last year, which shows a dramatic decline in AIDS related mortality happening over the last uh, 10 years. Uh, there is almost a 40% decline in the AIDS related deaths. Now, obviously what this has led, this is a stupendous success story, but ob obviously what this has led is people are surviving longer and are aging. And aging also, as we know, brings its own set of complications and whether HIV amplifies those complications is something which is of intense uh, research interest. This is the global trend of the proportion of people living with HIV. If you look at high income countries, almost 40 to 50% of uh, people uh, with HIV currently are 50 years uh, uh, or uh, more. And the 50 years cutoff is currently used in the HIV context to define uh, elderly HIV. Uh, in the lower income settings, we find around 15 to 20% of individuals are uh, more than uh, 50 years. This is a modeling study done by the National AIDS Control Program in India, which was published uh, last year. Uh, which looks at the estimated uh, age distribution of uh, HIV infected individuals from 2005 to 2025 using a validated uh, some spectrum model. And as you see here in the blue graph here, you see the proportion of individuals who are uh, going to be more than 50 years old is uh, widening and the proportion of uh, people who are uh, less is uh, going down. So we will have a significant burden of elderly people uh, with HIV infection who would be there uh, in the near future. And this is our own data. I quickly tried to collate it from our own uh, database. And actually I was surprised to see that 50% of patients who attended our uh, services at IID in the last year, 2019 actually, because 2020 was difficult year, uh, follow-ups were not good. So this in 2019, almost 50% of individuals were more than 50 years. And we had almost 35% of individuals who were between the age group of uh, 50 to 60. So half of our HIV patients who come to our clinic are actually more than 50 years. And those are some issues that we need to really uh, deal with uh, along with management of HIV. So after understanding these numbers and the likely burden that we are going to see, we will talk about some of the important uh, antiretroviral issues in elderly uh, people living with HIV. First, when do you start? Uh, I think this is something which is uh, uh, a no-brainer now. We know that antiretroviral therapy should be started irrespective of CD4 count 
or a viral load or clinical status. But the data looking at the benefit of antiretroviral therapy early initiation comes from the START study where patients were randomized to immediate versus deferred and then subsequently stratified to look at the uh, cumulative proportion of individuals who developed a AIDS defining or a non-AIDS defining event. And you see here when you initiate antiretroviral therapy early in individuals with age more than 50 years, the benefit is dramatic as compared to initiating it in less than uh, 50 years. So maximum benefit of initiating ART is actually seen in terms of percentage uh, benefit uh, when you initiate them in the elderly population. So very clearly all elderly population should be initiated on ART for reducing both AIDS as well as non-AIDS events. The other aspect is of course, once you start ART, what is going to be the response to ART? And very earlier on about a decade ago, uh, studies have shown that virologic suppression rates are similar. This is a uh, age stratification of virologic suppression rates, 24 uh, months uh, from initiating ART. And you see here in this curve, there is no difference in individuals more than 60 or more than 50 years as compared to young. So virologic suppression rates with the effective antiretroviral therapy is similar in elderly as well as, uh, as compared to say young uh, uh, HIV infected individuals. But there is some trend to suggest that because of immunosenescence, which is age related decline in immune function, which everybody has, is there is a poor reconstitution of CD4 counts which happen. And this is uh, the graphs in the same study showing you that the CD4 reconstitution uh, uh, cumulative incidence of not improving to less than or not improving to more than 100 is uh, actually higher in uh, patients with the age of uh, more than 50 years. So CD4 reconstitution is a little uh, issue when you initiate ART in elderly uh, people living with HIV. This is another UK study also which shows as compared to young population, the CD4 reconstitution almost six years. This is a longer data. Uh, the reconstitution is good. The reconstitution is happening in both these uh, age groups, but uh, in uh, elderly, more than 60 years in this case, it is a little less than the CD4 reconstitution, which happens in young people. Whether this translates into mortality, particularly when you initiate ART in an elderly person who comes to you for the first time, more than 50 years, this is data from uh, Mumbai uh, State's uh, AIDS Control Society clinics, uh, which was published uh, earlier this year. And what they really found, apart from various characteristics like baseline CD4 count, uh, concomitant TB, uh, age more than 50 year at initiating ART was associated with little higher mortality as compared to initiating it in young population. So obviously, this is a, this is just a trend but uh, not essentially that, you know, the mortality may be really dramatically high. You see, there's not much difference in the proportion of individuals in these uh, across these groups. The third point is how do we choose ARVs in the elderly when we initiate treatment? And this is predominantly dictated by comorbidities. So in an individual with a low EGFR, you would like to avoid tenofovir or atazanavir and perhaps look at uh, if the right patient candidate is available to either use staff or, for example, using an NRTI sparing regimen now, dolutegravir and 3TC. Individuals with osteoporosis, particularly postmenopausal osteoporosis, you would avoid TDF and go in for either TAF or a NRTI sparing regimen. In an individuals with background psychiatric illness, you would avoid effavirenz. So would you avoid effavirenz in HIV-associated dementia? and perhaps uh, look at using INSTEs. In individuals with high CV risk as measured, and we'll talk about it, avacavir, lopinavir, ritonavir are associated individually with high risk of uh, cardiovascular events. And uh, so you would perhaps choose INSTE and if you want to use a PI, look for using atazanavir, ritonavir. In hyperlipidemic individuals, avoiding PI as well as effavirenz and choosing INSTE and perhaps here TAF is associated and we'll see some data there associated with more hyperlipidemia as compared to TDF. So here you may perhaps for that pur purpose choose TDF rather than uh, TAF because of its lipid friendly uh, effect. 
and finally special issues in choosing a regimen these are multiple things that we will be talking about the first is of course age causes uh, changes in drug metabolism renal function decreases uh, liver function decreases this can lead to impaired drug elimination and lead to higher drug levels with the possibility of higher toxicity happening in uh, patients uh, who are elderly on arvs and this is a pk data looking at uh, darunavir as well as atazanavir uh, in the study group and the control group this study group is elderly people and these are young people you can see slightly higher levels of darunavir and atazanavir uh, as compared to younger population but in this study they didn't actually see a higher incidence of adverse events uh, associated with this so one of the things you have to remember is closely monitor for adverse events because of impaired elimination of uh, arvs uh, in in the elderly population the second issue is obviously polypharmacy elderly population has a lot of comorbidities and that's why they are going to be on multiple drugs and this is a study from the max cohort which looks at uh, hiv positive as well as hiv negative and you see here when it the age is more than 50 years the proportion of individuals on more than five drugs polypharmacy was defined as five drugs This is much higher in the HIV positive as compared to the blue bar here, who are HIV negative. But eventually, over the follow-up, it closely matches. So it looks like HIV positive individuals need more therapy earlier on, in terms of their age, as compared to HIV negative. With bringing this concept of premature aging uh, in HIV, though this is something which is still uh, quite controversial. and whether you look at using antihypertensives or cholesterol lowering drugs at the age of more than 50 years you consistently see hiv positive patients needing more uh, antihypertensives or more uh, cholesterol lowering drugs as compared to hiv negative this will obviously bring the risk of uh, drug drug interactions and uh, once you have polypharmacy and this is maximum with protease inhibitors this is a very uh, nice study uh, from i think france Uh, where they looked at the incidence of ddis amongst uh, patients initiating various regimens and you can see here the maximum incidence is in patients who are using protease inhibitors followed by nn nnrtis and uh, then you have insts which have least except for cobicistat elvetegravir obviously because of the cobicistat component you have a little higher drug drug interactions there so ddi has to be closely monitored in elderly individuals when particularly they are on multiple uh, regimens multiple regimens would also bring adherence concerns because now we have achieved this one pill once a day for hiv but then if a patient is also taking diabetics cholesterol lowering medications aspirin etc so then it goes back to the high pill burden so that can impact adherence then there is accessibility issues as well elderly population usually have are neglected in terms of uh, care uh neurocognitive issues particularly dementia which may make them forget to take the medications and toxicity as i already told you may be a little higher in the elderly population on art now last we will come down to selected comorbidities in uh, elderly uh, people living with hiv and this is the range of comorbidities which has been found to be a little higher in the hiv population as compared to hiv negative cardiovascular risk cancer uh, kidney disease or ckd and then you have liver disease including end stage liver disease uh, bone disease as well as uh, neurocognitive uh, disturbances so when you look at data for this there is certainly as compared to hiv negative population there is a higher incidence of non aids events and this is much amplified at a uh, later age group so as you see here non aids define uh, events like myocardial infarction uh, at the age of less than 50 there is not much difference but there dramatically increased incidence in hiv positive uh, compared to hiv negative uh, after 50 years so 50 to 59 you see 60 to 69 you see and more than 70 years you see uh also it is the same for end stage renal disease you can see the same data here as above age of 50 years the incidence of this non aids events is higher as compared to young uh, population young uh, hiv infected individuals uh, as compared to um, hiv negative population and so is true for non aids defining cancers you can again see that gap is very large 
at the elderly uh, age group as compared to young and so is for hiv associated cancers as well the the gap is also high from 40 years onwards but it is dramatically amplified uh, more than 50 years so non aids events all these comorbidities occur at a higher frequency now that if these are the population who are going to come to you uh, for follow up you need to be really vigilant to diagnose and uh, manage this uh, we uh, really don't know what causes this non aids events we all know 90% of our patients are actually virologically suppressed they are having good cd4 counts we have stopped monitoring for cd4 counts in our routine clinical practice so wh what is driving these events which is higher than the general population and uh, major focus is on inflammation which continues to be high even in suppressed uh, individuals and uh, immune activation leading to this but also there are other issues like age is something which also uh, that we are talking about contributing to non aids comorbidities and bmi this is something which is important because we'll be talking about bmi in the context of arvs uh, in uh, in the next few slides so there are multiple factors which can lead to a higher incidence of non aids events or other comorbidities in hiv positive elderly population so the issue of weight with this newer arvs that we are actually using uh, taf uh, and uh, integrase inhibitors this is pooled analysis across uh, clinical trials uh, as you see here the uh, mean weight increase is much higher with integrase inhibitor as compared to protease inhibitor and nnrti and amongst the integrase inhibitor bigtegravir and dolutegravir also have significant weight gain as compared to say cobc stat and amongst the nrtis you can see taf uh, causing significant weight gain as compared to say abacavir tdf or uh, zidovudin actually causes uh, lipoatrophy so you may have a little weight loss there so essentially this uh, slide shows you the signal for a significant weight change happening with integrase inhibitors and uh, taf whether this translates whether this has metabolic impact is something which is under investigation and it is very difficult to really cheese this out uh, because we whatever definitions we use or whatever risk calculators we use for assessing either cv risk or metabolic syndromes are not validated in the hiv population they are usually used in the general population but with the definitions it that have that are prevalent now in this advanced trial we which we know was carried out in africa uh, and of course this it does not reflect caucasian or indian population uh, but in this they uh, clearly showed higher metabolic syndrome in individuals who were on taf ftc dtg as compared to say efavirenza based uh, whether you look at it uh, all participants or more in women actually so women uh, had a risk of uh, high bmi in that or high metabolic syndrome and uh, men as well so taf ftc dtg uh, is something uh, which is uh, is uh, showing a signal of weight gain with a possible long term av risk uh, cv risk uh, uh, complication or obesity leading to multiple uh, complications there is also other issue of uh, taf causing hyperlipidemia and uh, this is a uh, we all know we have been shifting from tdf to taf and we have seen it in our practice as well that lipids get worse and this is a pre and post study looking at various cholesterol uh, parameters you see here after switch uh, to taf there is an increase from tdf now we don't know whether taf causes an increase in lipids or whether tdf causes decrease or tds has an uh, inhibitory effect it's believed that tdf has an inhibitory effect on uh, weight gain as well as on uh, uh, lipids uh, and uh, and once you remove somebody from tdf you may actually see uh, the taf switch causing uh, an unmasking of uh, hyperlipidemia so i'll give, briefly give you some of the approaches that you should be using these are mostly mirroring what is true in the general population in internal medicine practice so normally we would recommend to do an annual uh, screening for lipids and uh, sugar Uh, in your hiv positive elderly patient who's on uh, art and virologically uh, suppressed as well uh, once you see that you need to assess uh, ascvd risk and we do this ascvd uh, 
uh, score which is available uh, freely and it's available as an app as well but uh, the again as i said before that the validity of this in hiv positive population is not known so hiv uh, people uh, researchers have developed their own estimation called the dad estimation model you can use either of them dad is also available as a web based uh, calculator if the acvd risk is more than 7.5 and you basically up at ad, upward adjust it for hiv hiv itself can cause an increased cv risk so after adjusting for hiv if you find that it is more than 7.5 and you adjust one and a half to two times for the hiv status and uh, if or if the dad is more than 3.5 uh with or without a family history of heart disease with a absolute ldl of more than 160 or with concomitant ckd you need to intervene lifestyle modification we'll not talk about it which includes exercise and medical nutrition therapy risk factors need to be managed hypertension diabetes and statins needs to be started but start low and go slow particularly looking for drug drug interactions especially with protease inhibitors uh, and uh, some of the non nucleosides for hypertension uh, screening this is the indian guidelines so which was published which is uh, published last year 2019 guidelines but predominantly in elderly population it is recommended to use calcium channel blockers up front or a combination of calcium channel blockers with a diuretic and if the bp target is not achieved you go for a combination of ace inhibitor arb with a calcium channel blocker uh, with diabetic the issue is calcium channel blockers have interaction with protease inhibitors so be careful when you are prescribing this to check for drug drug uh, interaction in that context this is again icmr guidelines for managing diabetes in india it's little complicated but what i wanted to say that it's not much different in the hiv context initially you need to really focus on giving metformin if the abc a1c target is not met then you can go for uh, adding a uh, dual or triple treatment based on the target that you achieve either with sulfonylureas or dpp4 or sglt2 uh, inhibitors uh, from the hiv perspective metformin uh, has as we all know drug drug interaction with the integrase so dolutegravir or bictegravir can actually increase metformin levels with the theoretical risk actually of lactic acidosis but we have not really seen this but the recommendation is not to use more than 1 gram of metformin along with integrase inhibitors and metformin causes weight loss and in a lipoatrophic patient may actually worsen lipoatrophy uh, this is interesting because many of our diabetic patients are on sglt2 inhibitors and when we do their urine screening routinely you see glycosuria uh, because sglt2 inhibitors uh, work by uh, excreting sugar through the tubules you will see glycosuria but this often triggered nor this often triggered uh, 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 screening for fanconi syndrome uh, in our uh, patients on tdf so you have to be very careful when you are think you, when you are looking at glycosuria whether the patient we in diabetic on tdf whether the patient is actually on sglt2 inhibitor and then you really don't need to go into working up for uh, glyco for uh, fanconis for ckd i think again uh, we do the same kind of screening monitoring creat as well as urine uh, protein either by dipstick uh, or if it's available a urine protein creat ratio but if the proteins are high in a dipstick then only we may go for a protein creat ratio so protein urea assessment is as important as G gfr remember ckd is not just gfr it's also based on protein urea Uh, you do at least annual monitoring uh, do a gfr estimation uh, and the validity of the various estimation methods like cg or mdrd or ckd epi equations have not been done in hiv but still for ckd monitoring we use the ckd epi formula and uh, if the patient has some problems we would usually recommend uh, sending the patient to a nephrologist because that is quite complicated to manage there are multiple issues in ckd right from anemia to bone etc which needs to be taken care of so get a nephrology referral for your patient and work together uh, in that context for bone disease i think uh, if you look at international guidelines they usually recommend doing a dexa Uh, and then calculate a frac score if the, uh, for all postmenopausal women or males more than 50 we don't do it in our routine clinical practice but what we do is anybody coming to us with a history of fracture 
fragility fracture, particularly if they are older than 50 years, then we would recommend a DEXA uh, if possible. Otherwise, calculate a FRAC score uh, without a DEXA and then look out whether the patient has osteopenia, osteoporosis, be either based on the DEXA score or on the base, uh, basis of FRAC score. Uh, and then intervene, uh, trying to avoid TDF in both this context, as well as giving vitamin D and calcium. With use of calcium, of course, you need to separate it out with your uh, integrase inhibitor because of uh, drug drug interaction. Yeah, we would recommend um, that and for osteoporosis, uh, you also need to use uh, bisphosphonates. Uh, we prefer to use zoledronic acid annually because we have been giving it for our patients. Uh, particularly women with uh, severe osteoporosis. As far as malignancy is concerned, screening for cancer uh, is similar to general population. Uh, most predominantly, we do this cervical pap smears uh, for invasive cervical cancer. Uh, USG liver if patient is concomitantly HBV or HCV to rule out uh, HCC. And the role of uh, PSA for diagnosing prostate cancer is something which is uh, controversial. Uh, but Certainly, we do clinical. We have a very low threshold. If clinically based, there is a long-standing uh, HIV smoker, uh, patient who is HIV, who is also a smoker with significant weight loss, and you reasonably have ruled out opportunistic infections, doing well, CD4 count is good, you would get a CT lung. And we have been able to diagnose CA lung in uh, some of these patients. So clinical acumen is uh, important if you want to direct your screening for cancer based on uh, based on the history that the patient gives. Diagnosis may be an issue, particularly because if your staging is based on lymphadenopathy, we know HIV itself causes reactive lymphadenopathy. And when we follow up with PET scans, we have this problem of trying to find out whether the lymphadenopathy is HIV related or because of the cancer itself. So you have to be very wary of uh, that. And finally, management issues is uh, drug drug interactions, even dolutegravir. You know, all, we will always check for interactions using the Liverpool calculator. Dolutegravir has a potential interaction with binblastin. Normally, we believe that instees don't have interaction, but with a drug like binblastin, there is a potential interaction of dolutegravir. If you are using drugs, cancer drugs, which are basically causing hematological uh, problems or hematological uh, cancer drugs using for hematological malignancy, you may have CD4 falling down, but the patient is virologically suppressed. So you need to be well versed with the uh, reinitiating prophylaxis when the CD4 falls down uh, and not worry about changing the ARV regimen based on CD4 count if the patient is virologically suppressed. And there is, of course, additive toxicities. Uh, and now this immune checkpoint inhibitors are quite commonly used in cancer management. And those uh, need to be really uh, looked into in terms of additive toxicity with the ARVs. Finally, uh, talking about neurocognitive impairment, again, as you see here, as age advances in the HIV context, there is a dramatic increase in the impairment that you see, neurocognitive impairment on ART. Now, this is something which is very, very difficult in our clinical practice to really approach this problem uh, because we know that hand is clearly associated with poor adherence to ART or lower retention to care, follow-ups may be a problem and higher morbidity mortality. But it is very difficult to differentiate it from age-associated neurocognitive impairment like memory, memory loss or uh, impairment in executive function. It's very difficult to screen also because some of these small uh, rapid scales that we have, say the mini mental status or the MOCA score, for example, this routine screening are not really very sensitive specific. And if you want to do a very detailed screening for neurocognitive impairment, you don't have that time in your practice. So this is something which is very difficult and perhaps you need to establish uh, additional facilities in the clinic to really screen for this uh, neurocognitive uh, problems. Uh, what we use uh, as a trigger to screen in detail is if usually this patients either self-report or the relatives report, because many a times patients may not have the insight, but the relatives say that, you know, this guy is not able to count money. This guy is forgetting many things. So that is a real trigger. So again, be clinically uh, vigilant to uh, look for uh, these signs. And again, uh, changing uh, ART based on uh, CP score is unclear. The benefit of this is always controversial. And uh, we can't really be very sure that patients may improve or uh, not improve based on changing ART with good uh, CP score. 
And finally, I would just end with the liver disease. And I would not talk about HBV, HCV. Much has been said about that in the context of HIV. But in the long-standing HIV patient who's aging with a significant metabolic problem that we already discussed, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, particularly NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, is emerging as an important problem. And this is, uh, I think, uh, meta-analysis looking at various uh, studies, but the prevalence is around 20 to 40 percent, almost 30 percent prevalence. So it's quite high, uh, the prevalence. And we know uh, that NAFLD can also lead to cirrhosis as well as a small risk of hepatocellular carcinoma as well. Now, we don't know how to screen for this. We don't have clear guidelines for this. And the management is also something which is evolving, which predominantly relies on lifestyle modification like uh, diet as well as uh, exercise and in a situation if the patient develops fibrosis or cirrhosis then you would go in for the same uh, things that you would be doing for an HIV negative uh, person. So I think in summary uh, we already are seeing a significant proportion of our HIV patients coming to a clinic who are more than 50 years and many of us would perhaps be seeing a large proportion of our patients who will be elderly in the near future. In these patients, the ARV choice is usually decided by the type of comorbidities they have because significant proportion of these individuals will have medical comorbidities. Now, managing this comorbidity, screening for this comorbidities usually follows the same principles that we use in the general population in our internal medicine practice. So we need to apply that uh, in the context of HIV, but be a little more vigilant because the incidence of these events may be a little higher in the HIV positive population as compared to the negative population. And I think there is large opportunity for research uh, in this uh, area, in the aging and HIV area, uh, to try to optimize the current management guidelines that are available in the general population to translate it and try to individualize it uh, for the HIV uh, patient who's sitting in front of us. So I think that's all and uh, thank you for your attention. Later on, I'm open for questions. So thank you, Sanjay. It was, as I said in the beginning, it was as excellent as always. And I think, uh, we will go with the second presentation and then come back with the questions during the panel discussion. So can I have the slide uh, introducing Dr. Ganga Kedka, please? Yeah. Uh, now, uh, as I said in the beginning, these are the two people, whenever they speak anywhere, whether that is in the HIV conferences or otherwise, it is worth going there. And in true sense, I think uh, Dr. Ganga Khedkar is a person who does not require any introduction. Uh, those in the HIV field for last 25 years know him as whatever, friends, philosopher, guide. And uh, this is a long career. He was there as a household name last year during the COVID pandemic. And he has been doing everything possible from his safe home and we wish him that he is safe at home. And I am not going to read out his uh, uh, CV from the slide. I will straight away because he really does not require any introduction. I will straight away request him to start with his presentation. Thank you. Can you, can you ask him to allow slide sharing? Yeah. One minute, huh? something is... I can't understand why. Yeah. Now, is this visible now? And am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. Please, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so, 
now uh, what we will try to do is look at covid 19 in hiv and elderly patients i thought the major focus then perhaps has to have has to be more on vaccines as we go ahead we would perhaps try and understand more about uh, why we are saying that one of the most important things which i must do is i need to go for a disclaimer covid 19 is one of the most rapidly evolving science that we have witnessed ever in the past the findings that we quote by and large are as updated as possible but they also represent a reference period only uh, just a par part of our past last one and a half years and we still we cannot generalize based on those findings as easily as one would like to this is the most important uh, disclaimer mainly because this is a mutant uh, mutating virus it can also impact the transmission efficiency, the virulence as dramatically as we know about the variants at this juncture. And therefore, we have to consider every, every aspect that we try to infer from with a pinch of salt, whether these findings would continue to remain the same when you look forward uh, subsequently uh, for its application. Why worry about HIV infected individuals in COVID era? No, one must remember that uh, these people may be having better health seeking uh, behavior compared to other population and therefore perhaps even better COVID appropriate behavior. More so, you know, one must also remember that uh, SARS-CoV-2 relies in replication on polymerase and protease enzymes, which are also similar kinds of enzymes that we faced in uh, HIV. The, uh, there was a South African study which alluded to protection from tenofovir uh, based ART some part some point in time which is yet to be confirmed as uh, an important initiative which one can actually undertake and try to do all kinds of things those these people are immunocompromised and therefore you know one must remember that there is a dual assault of different organisms one is hiv and the second is covid which is going to lead to lymphopenia and the and the implications could be as challenging in terms of management but perhaps you know one must also remind oneself that there is likelihood of development of comorbidities prematurely among hiv infected individuals uh, dr pujari has already alluded to the same and there is all there are also other co-infections like tb hepatitis b c and another important factor is CMV, which is also fairly common as chronic uh, persistent infection in our bodies. What is, what is also important is perhaps there may be higher mortality rates that could be associated with COVID-19 infection among those who are HIV infected. Now, one of the issues that came forward was since the enzymes for replication are similar to those in HIV, would these antiretroviral drugs impact? We had uh, different kinds of evidences that came. These evidences tended to suggest that perhaps some suggested that yes, it does. Some suggested it does not. So essentially, wh what could be the inference? Perhaps it could be also because of period effect in rapidly evolving outbreak per se. If you look at HIV infected individuals and try and understand would they would they acquire COVID-19 as as much as easily? If you look at the meta-analysis, what does it show? It shows that those who are HIV infected individuals, you know, if you look at the overall uh, relative risk, it comes to about 25% increase in the risk of acquiring them. Now, would there be a biological plausibility to suggest why this must be happening? Perhaps there is none. Now, is it related to mobility that they tend to go out to buy their, get their tablets as replenished? No, that perhaps is another factor that we have to keep at the back of mind. However, there is no biological plausibility as of now to understand why the risk continues to be higher among them, unless we are talking in terms of receptor polymorphisms that tend to exist. But that, that data is also available. When it comes to diagnosis in co-infected individuals, one must remember that RT-PCR for diagnosis, that remains as a gold standard. But if you use HIV ELISA, especially that which is chemiluminescent assay, 
you find that person who is having covid 19 infection or who had covid 19 infection in the past is likely to come as false positive now that is mainly because there is a homology <clears throat> between sars cov 2 and hiv 1 as such and therefore there is a cross reactivity that tends to happen but the duo test continues to detect this particular uh, confusion more accurately therefore one could always rely on uh, distinguishing uh, the elisa result that could come out after uh, giving it to a covid infected individual uh, at that juncture if you look at who is getting this particular infection if you look at their age groups that comes as a bigger surprise mainly because the, there is a difference in the age groups among those who are HIV infected and those who are HIV negative. This is a study that was done in UK where they found that the, the, though there is no difference in mortality, one of the things that is also that becomes also apparent that uh, the 28 day mortality tends to be little higher and that comes as a complete surprise. It's not only a higher proportion of younger people getting admitted among those who are HIV infected, but less than 60 years old are likely to face and face a hazard of death, which is increased by almost three folds at this juncture. Now that's something which is very difficult to interpret. That is mainly because when you look at their data, you realize that there were very few individuals who had chronic morbidity as an underlying issue, which could have had led to increase in morbid, morbid uh, mortality rates. That's something which is ununderstandable as of now. Perhaps it's also an implication that could be associated mainly because of the evolving treatment, uh, because there were lots of differences in management that occurred in last one and a half years time, especially the use of steroids that came later may have had uh, played an important role the use of remdesivir may also be an important issue, but those issues cannot be teased out so easily from these uh, uh, manuscripts as such. COVID-19 disease mortality, if you look at other papers that have come up, you realize that HIV infected individuals have a higher mortality rate in general, if you, if you try and see that. If you look at UK's primary care database, you realize that the adjusted hazard ratio is almost two and a half times higher which essentially mean the likelihood of death is more, more uh, possible if somebody is HIV infected. If you look at ISARIC study, that was also done in UK. Yeah, this was done only among the hospitalized patients. The earlier one was a primary care database. There also they found that the risk of uh, the hazard of death was close to about 1.7 times higher among those who were HIV infected. But if you look at US uh, study, you realize that uh, there is no difference in mortality between HIV infected and those who are not infected by HIV. Even if you adjust for chronic morbidities, there are no differences that tend to become apparent. And therefore, this continues to remain as one dilemma all the time. But it would be prudent to assume that the risk could be higher and therefore, I need to prevent this infection rather than uh, not worrying about uh, use of COVID appropriate behavior. Co co if you look at the comorbidities and you look at the age groups you know, among those who are HIV infected, now you will suddenly realize that if you look at what was recorded in UK, you find that the comorbidities, their number tends to keep on increasing as the person ages. Now, what is important for one to remember, the comorbidities that they looked at was uh, hypertension. Almost one in three cases had hypertension after the age of 50. This data is also of the past 2017 and 18. Hyperlipidemia was seen in almost similar proportions. Depression was found in almost one in four. Renal impairment was at 15%, CVD, obesity, diabetes, and osteoporosis in 5% were seen in these, uh, these issues. What is important is multiple comorbidities tend to increase with age from 37% as one of the point estimate for the age group of 50 to 54 years 
the for the presence of one or more comorbidities it jumps up to 63% when it goes beyond 70 years age group and that's something which is worrisome because you know if you are hiv infected and also have comorbidity then in those cases the risk of adverse outcome tends to increase even otherwise uh, looking at uh, whatever data tends to come to you if you look at a recent meta analysis that has been done what does it essentially show that the risk of uh, death as a hazard tends to increase by close to about two times now which essentially means if it is a hiv infected individual if the person develops covid-19 infection perhaps the risk of death would be two times higher compared to somebody who may be hiv negative and therefore we need to worry about uh, uh, adhering to covid appropriate behavior as well as uh, uh, taking vaccine as quickly as possible when it comes to some of these drugs especially those that were used against protease inhibitors when the studies were done they realized that they were they were good they were found to be perhaps useful when it was uh, xyo studies and computer docking studies unfortunately when it came to any kind of combination that was used with boosted lopinavir or even cobicistat and darunavir they did not find any kind of impact and those studies were did not go go forward as much as one thought at that juncture so therefore these protease inhibitors may not be useful in managing these patients now were certain issues that tend to come to our mind as do we need to change antiretrovirals if patient has covid-19 you don't need to do that what is important that we must we must remember all the time that majority of the drugs that you use in covid management they are also compatible with the antiretrovirals that you are going to use and therefore there is not much to worry with respect to change of antivirals if a person is detected as hiv positive when he was he is having active covid-19 infection and hiv is known as a new hiv infection then then what is also important to remember that we need to look carefully at as to which test was being done to say that the person was hiv infected you need to ensure that you at least do a do test and try to look at it you could probe beyond that but when somebody has covid 19 we also know it produces lymphopenia and therefore when you have lymphopenia it would be good to avoid the hiv disease staging at that juncture because once covid is gone perhaps you will find that the entire parameters would change dramatically and if you want to initiate art in such an individual it would be good to consider uh, consult a hiv medicine uh, expert mainly because initiation of art needs to be needs to be harmonized with the recovery uh, of covid-19 as well as possible so that the recovery is also not hampered because of these issues 10% of uh, hiv covid infected individuals they tend to develop post covid syndrome this is one of the studies that has been very recently published by P dr pujari and this post covid syndrome has been found to be lasting for more than 3 months that's about 109 days as it is talked of uh, in the in the paper what is also important for us to understand that these kinds of post covid syndromes are known to persist even beyond that right up to 6 months time so if we do the follow ups we may perhaps understand little more among those who have post covid syndrome as to what kind of impact is it going to produce on these uh, people who have hiv infected infection also now is covid vaccination safe among hiv infected individuals absolutely these are not live vaccines and what is important is some people will feel that in covid shield or sputnik they are using adenovirus but one must always remember adenovirus can also cause infection but the adenovirus that they are using is of a non replicating uh, nature and therefore it by itself cannot replicate in the body when you provide that and therefore there is hardly any risk that you could even think in terms of theoretical risk that could occur currently whatever covid vaccines have been developed so far 
they can be administered to a person who is HIV infected. But when you administer them, one of the things that we tend to worry about is whether the immunization or the take will occur as well as uh, uh, among those who are immunocompetent hosts. If you look at the antibody levels say, from a seroprevalence study that was done among HIV infected individuals, you'll realize that nucleocapsid antibody was found to be lesser among those in terms of the titers. It was lesser among those who were HIV positive compared to those who were HIV negative. Now, does this mean that these people you know, perhaps may not develop uh, develop right kind of take, perhaps not. No, there would be people who might say that if a person is vir not virologically suppressed, should I offer or is he not adherent? Should I offer vaccine to them? We should not think that way. It is important that we need to provide vaccines to all, whether they are stable or they are not on ART. The only worst case scenario could be the Neutralizing antibody titers that he might develop perhaps could be lower, but one must also keep at the back of mind that T cell sensitization could continue to occur. About those T cell sensitization issues, we still don't understand much because the time that we have passed is very short so far. But one thing which one must keep at the back of mind that as the time will pass by, we will perhaps realize that T cell sensitization may be an important event, mainly because reinfections continue to be, remain as low as one could imagine in COVID-19 infection, even to this date. If you look at uh, the issue of providing COVID shield or vaccines that are use, using adenovirus vector, one of the, uh, oh, I'm sorry. The, when you look at whether these vaccines have been tested, against those uh, who have HIV infection. If you look at Pfizer phase three data, phase three trials data, there were about 0.3% subjects who were HIV infected. They were, they were distributed in both arms. That means about 60-60 were, were distributed among those who received vaccines and those did not. So the number continues to remain uh, small and therefore safety analysis was also not possible. When it comes to Moderna's phase three trial, they included about 179 people who were HIV infected and the proportion was only about 0.6%. There was no difference in adverse events, though their numbers are small. We cannot largely comment on that. Those who were stable on ART, what was important that it was noticed that there was no difference in reactogenicity that is the local side effects, the systemic side effects that one tends to get immediately after taking the vaccine or the toxicity that could occur even on beyond those 48 hours where we tend to get worried about these uh, side effects. The efficacy of high risk groups that included HIV disease as, as a small component because it was only 179 people essentially was closer to what was reported for the general population. There was no statistical significant different uh, statistically. The difference was not significant. The, the efficacy was close to about 91%. Now, one of the issues that tends to come for us in India is one of the studies that was done while uh, vaccine trials, vaccines were being developed against HIV, there was a use of adenovirus vector that was done in the past. Now, when adenovirus vector-based uh, vaccines were used in HIV, one of the things that they reported that this increased the risk by 40% among those who were in, the, uh, in that group to receive these adenovirus-based vaccines because all of them were negative. 40% increase in terms of the incidence that was actually seen in this, this particular uh, trials per se. Now, this risk tended to wane off over a period of time. And it was also observed that if you go for subgroup analysis, there was no increase among those who, who were not circumscribed, but circumcised uh, men. Now, that's something which is important. Though th this has been reported, one must also remember that does this give you an adequate evidence to suggest 
that uh, we should not provide uh, these kinds of vaccines to those who are susceptible? Perhaps not. No, no, what we need to remember that we need to still continue to do rigorous safety studies to find out whether it enhances the risk of acquiring HIV infection as a consensus. Now, if you look at the implications, what might happen? One must remember that the, this is an unknown risk, but this is not something which would occur to HIV infected individuals, but this is likely to be seen among those who are HIV negative. Our coverage for ART has been high and therefore our HIV incidence is dropping down dramatically off late. Now, when this has dropped down, would I assume that there would be no risk whatsoever using adenovirus vector among certain population groups? Perhaps not. We must also remember that the treatment interruptions that have occurred because of lockdown perhaps may question you know, whether the risk would continue to remain at a low rate. And that's another issue that we have to keep at the back of mind. Why am I referring to this? Because it is not Covishield that will be a problem but the prob because it uses adenov adenovirus from the chimpanzee, it will not be Johnson & Johnson which will be a problem because they also use adenovirus 26. But this is clearly reflected as one that is associated with adenovirus 5. This is adenovirus 5 based vector is used in the second dose of Sputnik V and they don't mention any such kind of risk in their publication that has come out. So one may perhaps need to use caution when it comes to vaccinating those who are HIV negative among key subpopulations, those who are sex workers, those who are MSM. Perhaps it would be prudent. And as it is, we could always tell them that they're, they're, they need to raise their level of protection from acquiring HIV infection. They need to ensure that the protective behaviors or safer sex behaviors have to be followed rigorously in this particular population. Now, this becomes important because HIV infected individuals tend to develop comorbidities prematurely and presence of comorbidity in, is associated with severe COVID disease and death. Now, what is important is we need to think about HIV holistically, especially when it comes to prevention we may have to wait for certain evidences to come. Now we shift towards the aging population. We must understand how human beings, we currently speculate that they age. You know, there are two things that tend to happen. There is something which is called as inflammaging. Now, what do we mean by inflammaging? That is, if I have a chronic persistent infection, something like cytomegalovirus infection, which most of us tend to have, we could also be having HIV, we could be having HBV, which could be having HCV, which is not managed. No, in those circumstances, what happens? There is low level of inflammation and that brings us closer to the immune system becoming older, which is called as immunosenescence. Now, as it is because of age, we are likely to become older. Our immune system tends to become far older as senescent immune system. The cells they tend to become older. And as we grow older, one of the things that tends to happen is our chromosomes tend to lose the length of telomeres. Now, these telomeres tend to become short and shorter. Actually, telomeres tend to protect us from uh, becoming old or from the toxic effects that the environment is likely to pose to them. Unfortunately, that we start losing as we grow older. And then what tends to happen when we become older? The total T cells may remain constant, but naive T cells, they tend to shrink. And that's the reason we may be able to face off infections that we have faced earlier better. But when it comes to newer infections, you will find that we cannot bring back or any aggressive infection that tends to occur, we cannot rely on the naive T cells because the numbers tend to be smaller in those circumstances. It is also seen that there are higher levels of interleukin C, TNF alpha. These are these these belong to the chemokines as a category. And these are especially increasing if you have a chronic morbidity like diabetes or even malignancy. And therefore cytokine storm as a phenomenon, whether you see COVID-19 
or if you look at influenza that tends to be far more commoner mainly because of the nature of this immune response that tends to change change there if we were to look at you know how these change tends to occur there are two different types of immunities one is innate immunity second is adaptive immunity innate immunity tends to become uh, tends to be affected as we grow so innate immunity doesn't remain as good as we have it in childhood and that's one of the reasons why perhaps people tend to speculate that sars cov 2 if it would occur in children they perhaps don't produce so dramatic effect because their innate system is immune system is good but adaptive immunity is one on which those who are older tend to rely on when it comes to fighting the infection now what would be the impact you know when we grow older we may have weakened antimicrobial immunity that leads to susceptibility to respiratory infections predominantly that you tend to see when we get older there is a reactivation of chronic viral infection that also becomes possible especially like herpes zoster you no know, which tends to be there and my uh, immunity cannot handle it really well when it starts uh, tethering now there are import resp- impaired responses to the vaccines there is insufficient protection against development of malignancies because all of us know that there is a immune surveillance that our body tends to have any error that they find among or any aberration that they find during replication those cells are taken care of by the immune surveillance but that tends to get dropped off as we become older and there is a predisposition to unopposed tissue inflammation like atherosclerosis as osteosclerosis and neurodegenerative disorders that's an outcome of the same and what is also important is our wound repair mechanism start failing over a period of time what is important from covid angles we must also remember in addition to the classical symptoms that we know of some of the people elderly people they are likely to come with atypical covid symptoms which we need to recognize quicker as early as possible so that the monitoring becomes easier and we would be able to ensure that there are no delays in hospitalization that could occur these symptoms could be so minor that they might have dizziness long hours of sleep some of them may feel dehydrated and tired and some may present with confusion some may suddenly have severe incontinence you no know, sudden loss of appetite or sudden low blood pressure these are beyond the classical symptoms that we talked of what we know now about these elderly populations is the elderly persons are more likely to get sars cov 2 infection easily that's because of either their own behavior or they staying together and their likelihood of even exposure to somebody who is at higher risk because of its mo- his or her mobility that's something which we have to keep at the back of mind they may progress to severe disease rapidly and the mortality rates are higher among elderly persons now one of the things that happened which was perhaps the best thing to happen was there was a rapid development of vaccines and what did these vaccines do they these vaccines which we know are even currently available in india you find that they tended to protect people at a far efficient in a far efficient manner where the efficacy rates were found to be extremely high now in india currently though we are only looking at covid shield and bharat biotech's uh, co vaccine there are newer vaccines which which will also be uh, coming to india so there will be large number of vaccines that would be available so we try to look at it from the elderly's point of view subsequently when it comes to these vaccines what do they do when you talk of protective efficacy let's say it is 95% protective now what does it essentially mean 95 if you give that vaccine to 100 people 95 will not develop severe covid disease and almost all will be protected against death now this particular feature is extremely important for us to uh, remember and as one of the major reasons why we must take vaccines when it comes to the old age groups now what would be our first understanding sars cov 2 has a clinical outcome that tends to occur more commonly among elderly population but when it comes to elderly population 
when it came to generating evidence for any intervention, if you look at vaccine studies or even the drug trials that are going on, you find that these trials are being done not in the elderly population, but they are being done in the younger population. And that's a very paradoxical thing, which we have, we have to tease out over a period of time. Why this perhaps may be happening? This may be happening because, you know, the age cutoffs that they initially have, where they wanted to have a study design, which will perhaps be, maybe it may not be fully generalizable, but they wanted to avoid the risk of large proportion of people coming out with different side effects because of presence of comorbidities. And therefore, the older populations were not cleanly represented in the earlier trials that were done. There was a concern also of compliance. So perhaps people were worried if it is an older population, you know, those who are older may not remain compliant and it may pose problems in these vaccine trials or drug trials that tended to take place. They also have visual or hearing problems and their mentation is also slow. Now, in such circumstances, it might also become difficult for one to consent that individual. And that is another worry that perhaps those who started these studies had, had to negotiate. When it comes to uncontrolled chronic morbidities, everybody, you know, they wanted to exclude such people. And uncontrolled chronic morbidity, unfortunately, is more common among those who are older. And therefore, a large proportion tended to go out. The implications are very clear. You know, when it came to generating evidence, we have generated evidence among those who are classically not called as old. You can generalize that more for the older, uh, for the younger population that's less than 65 years of age. However, what we wanted to do was actually we were aiming at reducing the risk among those who are older. Now, we try to look at some of these vaccines and see how paradoxical the situation is. When it comes to AstraZeneca, they recruited about 11,636 uh, people in their uh, clinical trial. And you look at the representation. They had only 8% people between 56 to 69 years. And uh, 70 years up, there were only 4% people. So essentially, if you leave this 12% out, not 88% of the trial participants were maybe you won't call them as they are middle-aged population or lower than that. It Even their analysis doesn't clearly show whether the elderly population with comorbidity, even if it was 12%, whether they had comorbidity and what was the impact because their numbers are also pretty small. You look at AstraZeneca, at least that has a one positive feature. One is they tried to look at immunogenicity and reactogenicity among older populations. And what did they find? That the anti-spike antibody response was similar across all age groups, which includes even the older age group. The systemic reactions decreased with increasing age. No, so essentially, what is important is this finding has been noted almost all across in most of the vaccine trials that have been done. So it essentially means those who are older do not develop so many side effects, uh, which perhaps we are used to seeing, but then it gives rise to a concern whether the immunization has actually occurred among all of them. Now, when we are talking of Covishield, there's one issue that we have to remember, that recently you find that the interval between dose, first dose and second dose has been increased to about 16 weeks time. Now, would that be something which we have to, should do as such? Not as of now, especially when we know no, the variants that India is also uh, revealing, this particular Delta variant tends to tends to face, uh, tends to lose its own efficacy. Uh, the vaccine tends to lose its own efficacy. And therefore, we need to worry now whether we want to have a shorter duration between two dosages. One of the issues that was also talked of where age became important, and that is some of these people they develop CVST. Now, when they developed CVST, especially after getting Covishield, there were lots of worries that came about. But one thing we started emerging that this is because of an antibody 
that people tend to develop against heparin, which is called as PF4 antibody. And when they tried to look at whether the, the risk benefit analysis when it was done, they started realizing wherever the high infection rates, and for us, in terms of the elderly population, you should look at the row, lower bars you know, for the age groups between 60 to 70, 70 to 80, 80 and 80 plus, you will realize the likelihood of hospital admission or death due to CVST is perhaps perhaps the lowest when it comes to vaccine, but the hospital admissions and death that could occur in the higher age groups continue to remain high. So there is no reason for us to worry whether we should we should avoid giving Covishield vaccine. But this effect is by and large seen in the younger population so far that we have observed and among women. But the best way is to keep that suspicion, index of suspicion high and keep on looking for presence of headache and blurring of vision two days after receiving vaccine as one of the indicators for a neuro consult to be provided to people. Now, when it comes to Pfizer vaccine, Pfizer vaccine was perhaps little more stronger in terms of design for being inclusive. When you actually look at 65 to 75 years population, they had 21% of the study participants belonging to that. When it comes to more than 75 years, they had 4% population uh, uh, in that trial that belonged to this particular age group. When you actually look at them, they even define that uh, the, co uh, the comorbidities are also clearly defined there, where 65 to 75 percent, uh, 75 years age group had uh, 2,263 people with comorbidities, whereas 75 years plus, they had about 2 percent of that population which had uh, comorbidities per se. And if you look at their calculations of vaccine efficacy, this is perhaps one of the most important uh, um, outcome that they have described. You find that those, when they become older, where one of the fears is the older you get, you may become non-responder. But is that found to be real? At least it is not found to be real uh, among those who perhaps are 65 plus, uh, there is no statistically significant difference that you observe in the protective efficacy, which is represented as 100% uh, for more than 65, 91.7% for more than 65, and those who are at risk. When it comes to obese population, because there was there is also a fear that people who are older and obese may not be immunized really well. When it comes to that particular protective efficacy, even among those who were older, those sample size becomes smaller. They, there is, they, uh, the vaccine does not lose the protective efficacy. So essentially it means that in an elderly population, mRNA vaccine actually is, continues to work better. So there is at least some major evidence that we can think of uh, in terms of vaccine trial results for one of the vaccines. When it comes to Moderna vaccine, you realize Moderna also had a sizable population belonging to elderly age group, but they still don't have a clarity whether they have included elderly population with comorbidity or was it not there? Because all of them could be having different implications in terms of take and protection that could occur. But they tried to look at side effects and what did they find? That those who were 65 years plus they had lower side effects compared to those who were between 18 to 64 years uh, older. When it comes to Moderna's vaccine efficacy, what is it that they have found? That there was no difference between all those three groups, four groups, you know, 18 to 65, more than 65, 65 to 75, and more than 75. However, uh, in the end, you start finding that the numbers become smaller. One must also remember that majority of the people in US, when they become really old, they tend to stay in old homes. There, the risk can perhaps not be imagined to be same as you find with other people because of lower mobility. But once it enters, perhaps the entire cluster is likely to get infection. And that's another factor that we have to keep at the back of mind. Now, when it comes to Sputnik V vaccine, you find that they are close to about 10% people who were older and at least 40% of the population 
that was part of this particular trial had one or more comorbidity which they have defined there is another vaccine that is j and j vaccine which is also going to come to india in this particular vaccine they tested it among close to about 24% of uh, their study participants belong to older age group however it is unclear whether what proportion of them had actually chronic morbidity there if you look at the vaccine efficacy of j and j what is it that you try and see if you look at vaccine efficacy you suddenly start the older they become you know the point estimates improve dramatically though they are not uh, statistically significant but if you look at 14 day post vaccination if you look at 28 day post vaccination the point estimates are higher even if one becomes older though they are statistically not significant so essentially vaccines continue to work well even in the elderly population now there could be some issues that may come with the elderly population uh, as we see even in other population if i have covid uh, in the recent past or if i have received convalescent plasma recently or monoclonal antibody uh, recently as we have even monoclonal antibody coming up uh, in india one should take these vaccine 12 weeks after this particular thing has happened because the immune response can be better uh, if you do it afterwards and why do you delay the whole thing after 3 months of natural infection if you actually look at the d component you will realize that the take of neutralizing antibody titers tends to be much better after 3 months time and therefore it has to be taken after 3 months in addition to the fact that antibodies tend to decay after 3 months for sure can one receive different vaccines as two different dosages that should not happen in india it's unfortunate if it happens no interchangeability trials have not been done especially for the vaccines that we have in india pfizer and astrazeneca have done their own and it is essentially if you look at theoretically what does it tell you that it is not likely to make a much make much difference in terms of immunogenicity in fact if you have two different platforms perhaps you will have a better immune response that might come but my bigger worry because this is something which is not yet coming in the guidelines my bigger worry is if we require a third dose of a vaccine because a new variant has come and that is closer to be a new strain of this virus which doesn't remain amenable to the vaccine induced immune protection that we have in those circumstances a third dose may have to be given but there if i have already received in that uh, mixed population mixed vaccine dose uh, group if i have received adenovirus based vaccine then it might become very difficult for me to take it because antibodies against adenovirus would already be already be present so it may affect the take of this vaccine subsequently now all of us know that newer variants are coming and they are also challenging the vaccines uh, efficacy per se what is it that is emerging that if you look compare all these vaccines one of the estimates tends to suggest us that the uh, uh, the variants tend to lose its efficacy against the development of severe covid disease or acquiring infection which is which is further worsened compared to development of disease now among that when it comes to the b1 1.351 that is a south african uh, south african variant and p1 is the brazilian variant you find that there is a drop but when it comes to astrazeneca vaccine that drop is extremely high should we worry about it to some extent despite the fact that we still don't have sufficient evidence mainly because both these variants tend to have e484q uh, uh, e484k mutation which is closer to e484q which has been seen in india so we still do not know whether the tra translation could be similar though in vitro studies that is in the labs they claim that these vaccines do not lose the efficacy uh, are still able to neutralize this virus rather than efficacy neutralize the virus human studies are still lacking now one of the things that happen when we provide vaccine you know if i go by age priority groups you will find 
that the share of proportionate share of hospitalization tends to fall off dramatically now that speaks volumes how whether it is working among elderly population now in uk when they started providing a graded approach for those who are older you try to prioritize and provide that vaccine if you look at the graph of people who were getting hospitalized you will realize that as even with the first dose that they had received to begin with you find the older you are as the time passes by the likelihood that such age group people would be admitted in the hospital starts becoming less and lesser so it also tells us indirectly that whether it was astrazeneca this continues to remain the same for astrazeneca vaccine or also the um, uh, pfizer vaccine it essentially tells you the same thing that these vaccines continue to remain protective in older age groups as such one issue that tends to come how long will the protection last we still don't have robust data we know perhaps it may last for 8 months for sure but it may be longer unlike influenza because of t cell sensitization but we still don't have sufficient data to talk about it but what is it telling they telling us in terms of not only the entire population but if you actually look at the reinfection rates and try to look at this particular issue you will suddenly realize that the likelihood of reinfection in the older population is higher more than 65 years age group even after receiving the vaccine perhaps reinfection rates continue to be higher compared to the younger population so there could be a worry that some of the older population may require a booster if the virus doesn't require one for variant they may require booster subsequently But in conclusion high hiv infected and elderly population are at a higher risk of death due to covid-19 the management for both the diseases is not so different when you compare it with other population uh, and uh, the co infected people uh, second thing is vaccine trials were done predominantly in persons other than population in uh, population of interest fortunately for us they continue to remain protective but the evidence was actually not for use as easily as one would like to see in terms of uh, uh, vaccine trials A rapid roll out of vaccines will reduce the hospitalization and deaths dramatically thank you thank you sir as usual extensive and uh, elaborate uh, information about vaccination about everyone now uh, there are a few questions uh, but i think we'll get uh, manoj join the panel and then i will start asking the questions so can you have manoj now join the panel yes doctor can i start are you presenting i think yes uh, doctor hello yeah yeah yes doctor so, i am here i will i'll just introduce manoj manoj is again our very old friend uh, uh, from early days and uh, he has been member of community scientific sub committee on global community advisory board for aids clinical trial groups he has been member of ethics committee biomedical research icmr and nari he is the member founding member of national coalition of kl hiv in india network of maharashtra people living with hiv so he has been working uh, in this field for more than 24 25 years now and because uh, we have been in this journey together all the two speakers as well as manoj and me have been working together for a very long time and it's nice that to have manoj on this panel because he brings in the uh, community perspective uh, on this panel so i'll request manoj to go ahead with his presentation before we go for the panel discussion thank you so much doctor are you able to hear me doctor are you able to hear me yes yes okay 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 so thank you so much doctor um, and 
thank you so much Hetro uh, also for giving this opportunity. Uh, most of the things has already been covered by uh, uh, scientifically uh, information is covered by Dr. Puja and Dr. Ganga Kharka sir. Uh, one thing which I would like to highlight mainly is basically a difference uh, between just a survival and quality of life. So no doubt HIV has increased the uh, survival of the uh, individuals, but uh, the most important question is the quality of life. And uh, two, three things which Dr. Pujari also covered in the beginning that the aging uh, is much faster in people living with HIV than uh, other population. So even now 30, 40 years of uh, age of person of person living with HIV will look like 50, 60 year old. So that's the difference of uh, uh, aging component in the people living with HIV. Uh, when I say the uh, difference between survival and quality of life, uh, most likely like uh, uh, the increase of some lots of <clears throat> okay okay so uh, increase of lots of uh, non communicable uh, diseases and other things and uh, most of the uh, um, other um, drug related issues side effects uh, drug related side effects. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, most of the drug related side effects uh, is actually increasing the stigma. Uh, for example, uh, buffalo horn. Uh, most of our people are so. Uh, I came across uh, two, three cases where person is not going from the house uh, outside because. Sorry. So person is not going from the house because the people are asking question, what is happening, what is happening and uh, that the surprisingly that person is staying in the house for more than three years. That much stigma is uh, increasing by the side effects. Then uh, we all know that lipodiprosis uh, is also a major issue. People used to wear uh, two, three clothes from inside because people keep asking like uh, why you are becoming uh, more thin and more thin. Um, this is uh, some issues which we are facing in the uh, because of the side effects. Uh, the second part is the mental health. Uh, most of the uh, HIV medicines are actually increasing the um, uh, increasing the uh, mental illnesses issues. Uh, secondly, the sex and relationships, uh, especially in aging people, uh, society thinks that people uh, are getting older and they should not <laughs> uh, think about sex. And in people living with HIV, sex is itself is a taboo because it's a mainly sexual acquired uh, infections. One of the things which uh, Dr. Pujari uh, slightly covered is an older woman uh, living with HIV. And I request uh, this panel to have a, a similar kind of session only for women because older women living with HIV has a very different kind of uh, issues and probably they will not be able to uh, discuss in the uh, uh, open forum like uh, with other populations. Uh, I, I made some slides, but uh, for, unfortunately, I will not, I'm not able to share a uh, few things which I would like to uh, mainly uh, request all the doctors is basically uh, early suspecting uh, the aging related issues. Uh, and so that we can immediately start uh, treatment and uh, immediately uh, take charge of those uh, uh, issues related to aging and uh, side effects of long term uh, ARV related side effects. Um, and uh, I request all my friends, those who are here uh, joining, like please uh, be very, very careful about your own body. Uh, 
take treatment uh, uh, on time always uh, we see we run a pharmacy and we see people those who uh, um, started treatment but not visited their doctor for two years three years so please don't do that you have to visit your doctor frequently then only your doctor will be able to uh, see what is going on so always touch uh, routinely uh, touch with your doctor uh, eat bla uh, balanced and, and nutritious uh, food uh, do some at least uh, very little but um, keep doing exercise because that keeps you fit uh, join your peer support groups because that is very very important for your mental uh, support and uh, all your other um, peer related needs uh, if you uh, i don't want to go to like don't take meditation yoga as a spiritual thing but who, whatever religion you follow you do some kind of uh, uh, meditation yoga and uh, any other your wherever you get your mental peace uh, that is one thing again i request all doctors uh, please please uh, try to uh, if if a plhiv comes to you for treatment and if that person is uh, uh, above 50 so please explore all the other uh, illnesses possibilities and uh, start the treatment as early as possible uh, we just don't need survival we need a quality of life and uh, uh, we need more studies on hiv and aging in india specifically whatever hiv and aging studies are there it's all done in outside india and we have significant uh, number of uh, people living with hiv as mr nehru said in the beginning we are the third largest uh, population of people living with hiv and we need uh, this study so i request panelists like all three panelists are very good in research i request all three of you to please start uh, hiv and aging studies so that we generate indian specific data and we can guide and shape the india's hiv uh, arv treatment program Thank you so much. Thank you, Doctor Manikul Kani. Over to you. Thank you, Manoj. Now I request uh, both the panelists, other speakers, to join with their videos. And by the time they join, Manoj, uh, I would like to uh, ask you or just share your experiences of twenty forty years of this pandemic. Because every time we talk of uh, things about stigma discrimination and kind of things treatment has changed and treatment has prolonged life we do require quality of life but tell us something about the positive side of that how the things have changed in last 20 years definitely sir so the first biggest change sir initially uh, in 96 97 when counseling used to happen and uh, the counselor used to count like okay you acquired in 93 you have another 2 years to live because initially they are, it's not their fault but initially they also have been taught that the life of hiv positive person is 6 to 8 years and that's why they used to tell that so now whenever the person is get infected or tested positive there is a the message is like hope hope message oh there is a treatment don't worry you you can live a healthy and normal life so that's the major shift uh, of uh, the arv has brought um, and uh, definitely stigma has reduced uh, reduced it's not that uh, uh, like beginning and uh, i may be fortunate to um, uh, staying in pune and coming in contact with lots of uh, uh, good doctors and um, but outside uh, uh, maharashtra and like you know the recent example one of our person uh, died because of covid and he was not able to get icu bed because of hiv infection so we have to do lots of advocacy uh, and this was a case in patna bihar and so we have to advocate a lot and then we uh, finally after three days we got uh, him bed and but unfortunately he was not able to survive so stigma is still there um, hiv work has started in maharashtra and south part much earlier and then other part um, so we cannot say that is completely gone 
second thing is sir which i have brought uh, into the notice about the uh, side effect related stigma like the fellow horn is the case which i mentioned even the lipodystrophy where, where the uh, hand and legs are very very thin so people are very very uh, it's a self stigma i understand but also it's a like people ask keep asking questions like what happened what happened and pe- then people uh, try to uh, avoid meeting other people so those kind of stuff are still there yeah, one one thing question which has come up and i think the answer is very simple for that but that is because it is for the community there is one question which has come which is asking whether uh, elderly people with hiv can be uh, admitted to old age homes with others uh no. <laughs> why why not <laughs> no no sorry what is the question whether hiv infected people can also be admitted to old age homes with others but why should admit i'm not able because to... there is no one to care there are other old age oh, homes okay 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 okay, okay. 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 yeah why not <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely like it is it is like integrating we are integrating hiv infected of children course, with course. the schools hiv infected right, people right. should be allowed to old age home yeah. okay uh, i'll come to uh, you later again and i would like to ask dr ganga kedka there are some questions about uh, vaccine because you uh, gave a long list of vaccines and uh, there are some questions which vaccine should hiv infected people should take <laughs> and uh, the other question is uh, whether if someone has taken a covid shield uh, two doses four weeks apart should that person need a third dose because now you are saying 12 weeks is better than uh, four weeks so these are some of the questions uh, no, um, with respect to which vaccine would be good especially if you think in terms of hiv infected individual to my mind you no know, any vaccine you no know, could prove similarly i'll tell you the major reason you no know, if you are worried about covid shield losing its efficacy one must also remember that inactivated vaccines a whole virion inactivated vaccines are also having lesser immunogenicity unfortunately there is no data that has come out so you cannot dissect anything so we have no idea how they are actually planning out and this was actually you no know, seen very much in china tends to have many inactivated vaccines whole virion vaccines in some countries <clears throat> they have not done really well in some countries they found that the protective efficacy ranged in different countries from 51% to close to about 84 83% if i recall correctly so it essentially means that vaccines have their own issue all of them are first generation vaccines you should take whichever vaccine is available because it is quite possible that this environment of risk can go down if the virus tends to decide that it doesn't want to create any more problem and i can live with harmony in these people by reducing its reducing its virulence dramatically we still do not know what is going to happen so don't worry about the choices you can actually go ahead with it but if one has to think in terms of a choice perhaps i think you know, the uh, novavax vaccine may come out as a better one among them and i am making this statement um, <clears throat> without having that data whether it is of for astrazeneca with our variant or uh, covid shield with uh, co vaccine with our variant as such in terms of human data but i think on paper what looks good is perhaps novavax to my mind uh, this is this is this is all also, this is all theoretical but would it be prudent right now to tell people with hiv that you should go ahead and take whatever vaccine is available to you right now or whether you should wait for a better yeah. one to- absolutely not don't wait for anything because we have seen the second wave came very rapidly you know the number of cases that were occurring was so high uh, once the wave started if the third wave comes which may be because of variant in itself now if third wave comes 
no perhaps that way will rise far more sharply than we have seen earlier so the best is to take what it is you know whatever is available and don't worry about it we must remember that if there is a worst case scenario if something will not not be protective in any case there is a third dose that you can always take from a better vaccine but ensure that you are protected for your life right now rather than thinking about future the second question was what that that was the which one was the one and uh, whether yeah, uh, yeah. among the covishield and covaxin which should uh, be a better yeah. one yeah uh, no like i said uh, earlier also no one of the questions was if it is that instead of 12 weeks duration should i take yeah, it yeah. earlier and if i have received one where i have taken it after 16 weeks or 12 weeks then what does happen nothing is going to happen as i said the only thing that might happen is you might have as a worst case scenario lesser take of that vaccine but is that a reason to worry i still continue to believe that you would have a good protective response from t cells the only vaccine that has really studied the t cell impact really well is covishield the astrazeneca vaccine and it continues to appear appear as one more encouraging thing so i would not like to dissect anything more i would say take whichever vaccine you are getting there is a room to change subsequently if it is required there is there is another interesting question but i think the answer is going to be a short one it took just one year for uh, us to develop a vaccine against uh, covid or sars cov 2 is 40 years and we still don't have a vaccine against hiv why <laughs> that is mainly because uh, you know the hiv is far more smarter virus it tends to replicate at least two times higher compared to uh, not replicate it tends to accumulate mu mutate two times higher compared to sars cov 2 and it is able to generate escape mutants very quickly which are not allowing you to develop a broadly neutralizing antibody the way you are seeing a monoclonal being developed against sars cov 2 it's only because it is able to generate those kinds of things but does that mean that's the end of a hope for hiv vaccine perhaps not now that we know more about these platforms i'm sure the research will move in the right direction and they will still keep hiv as one of those uh, goals where vaccine should be produced thank you sir i'll i'll move on to dr uh, sanjay pujari uh, sanjay uh, you have been uh, again for last one and a half years been also treating a lot of covid 19 patients now there are some questions about uh, is there any difference in the treatment of uh, covid hiv co infection as regard as in comparison with standard treatment for covid do we treat the same way do we don't give any medicines for uh, the treatment of covid hiv co infection there is one question that when a person with hiv was admitted or treated was being treated for covid was advised to stop antiretrovirals during that period Uh, it will be all mild, moderate, and severe cases. So, would you throw some light on that? Yeah. So, I think the there is a two issues. One is management of COVID, and other is management of HIV. If a patient is stable on ART, you don't need to stop ART. ART continuation is extremely important, irrespective of whatever stage of COVID the patient may severity the of COVID the patient may have. Uh, so, don't interrupt ART. Uh, second if a patient is naive and uh, the patient has been diagnosed with covid 19 and then uh, also simultaneously new diagnosis of hiv then you would basically stabilize the patient's uh, covid 19 and subsequently later on uh, initiate antiretroviral uh, treatment uh, for that patient once that patient is stabilized for covid 19 management there are no differences as far as uh, therapeutics uh, that are used so the pillars of covid 19 management are basically oxygen support uh, anticoagulation and uh, steroids 
uh, and steroids, uh, uh, there is no really, we, we are using low dose, short duration steroids and steroids have been used in HIV. So it's not really a big issue there. Uh, one thing is if you are on a protease inhibitor based regimen, uh, you should be looking at the steroid with the PI interaction because steroid levels go high. So monitor for hyperglycemia or monitor for uh, hypercortisolism uh, in that context. Be careful about that. Otherwise, there is no difference in management. But there would be some issues about, uh, say, HIV TB, HIV MDR TB, HIV TB COVID uh, co-infection, and it would complicate the thing because it would it, it cannot be i know that it cannot be answered like this what you do because it would be a yeah, so these are very specific situations so rifampicin interaction has to be looked upon uh, if there is a tb uh, also uh, honestly i have not seen a patient who had hiv tb and covid all three together uh, in whatever uh, hiv covid i have managed uh, because mostly many majority of them are actually well suppressed and uh, have a good CD4 uh, count. Uh, but uh, this brings another interesting point and that is uh, 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 an HIV patient coming to you, particularly what has happened is many of the patients may have interrupted ART during the lockdown, etc. And uh, they, there may be a situation where the CD4 counts may have fallen. So there as it as uh, at risk for developing an opportunistic. And uh, we have actually published a case report in AIDS uh, where a patient presented exactly like COVID, radiologically, clinically, uh, as well as uh, um, uh, inflammatory markers uh, with a low CD4 count. But uh, PCR was negative for COVID from the bronchoalveolar lavage, but gene expert was positive for TB. So when you are working up these patients, also keep an eye on whether the patient is not on ART, whether what's, what was the last CD4 count, et cetera. And then also look for concomitant uh, opportunistic infections. Uh, there are some case reports uh, already, uh, case series also of COVID and uh, PCP, both together in HIV positive patients. So don't uh, just say that, you know, HIV uh, presenting a uh, COVID presenting presentation in the HIV means an OI may not be there. Also try to look for opportunistic impact. And also, are you uh, thinking that there could be because of this COVID uh, treatment with low or whatever low steroids, there is and the immune suppression likelihood that there could be more of reactivations of tuberculosis in post COVID period, we have to be worried about it. Right now, we are not seeing that signal anywhere in the world, including South Africa, where they have a very big database. Uh, TB itself increases COVID-19 mortality. The South African study that Ganga presented from Baul et al. Uh, has shown that HIV and TB both are independent factors for uh, severe COVID-19 and mortality. Uh, but whether uh, there is a signal for reactivation of TB, uh, I'm not sure. I have read anything uh, that TB... Uh, ATB is happening more commonly in the post-COVID uh, scenario. Uh, but uh, of course, we now talk about mucor and all those things. Though I have, those have distinct uh, risk factors like diabetes, uh, uh, hyperglycemia and uh, uh, steroid use. Uh, but whether that really, both of these actually also increase the risk of TB. But we have not seen that signal yet, but should be looked for, I think. Just one more thing, which was probably uh, not in your presentation, but for elderly HIV patients, what kind of immunization schedule you would suggest? Oh, yeah. So normally the recommendation irrespective of age actually is to get the pneumococcal vaccine uh, 13 followed by uh, 23. Uh, then hepatitis B vaccine uh, should be complete. It should not been uh, completed as well. Uh, the other vaccines like seasonal influenza vaccine uh, should also be uh, given to HIV positive individuals because of the higher risk for uh, severity because of seasonal influenza as well. COVID-19 vaccine. So that's a new vaccine that has to be there uh, in the portfolio. Uh, the issue about whether herpes zoster vaccine uh, should be given in HIV positive patients. So uh, normally the herpes zoster vaccine is recommended uh, for age more than 60 years in the HIV negative population. 
uh, we know that the we don't have the recombinant subunit vaccine available in our country, but uh, I think uh, the uh, inact, uh, live attenuated vaccine is available. And there are now convincing data uh, in HIV positive population to suggest that they are safe uh, to be given. So that may be considered because herpes zoster is quite a significant problem in HIV uh, infected, particularly as they oh, age itself is a risk and HIV it's also is a risk. So that may also be considered on a case to case basis. Which is asking one more question is uh, we are giving a lot of supplements nowadays zinc calcium d3 and kind of things and do they have any impact interactions with antiretroviral treatment uh supplements for what but if you are giving it for say uh, bone related issue d3 and uh, calcium i already mentioned in my presentation that calcium iron uh, these compounds interact with integrase inhibitors, so you need to separate the dosing uh, of these uh, two drugs. And we are talking only in the context of uh, integrase inhibitors because that those are widely uh, used. So apart from that, routine supplementation is really not recommended. There's not much evidence to suggest that it really changes or alters or provides any clinical benefit uh, to uh, elderly HIV patients. Can I ask one question? Because I, last two years I have not been as much in HIV. No, when uh, if I recall, no, 2018 or so, the ACTG group was planning to undertake studies which were using low dose methotrexate, uh, then uh, metformin, no, to reduce the rate of aging. I don't know whether they have been completed. No, I'm just asking a very naive question because I, I have not read as much about them. Whether some findings have come, how do we reduce the rate of aging? No, are there any agents that are currently being in trial or some results are available? Yeah, so sir, uh, there are uh, there were a lot of uh, trials, uh, particularly looking at anti-inflammatories, uh, because chronic immune activation was supposed to be the major uh, uh, pathophysiology for this. Uh, at present, I have not really come across any cons you know any completed study with uh, good design being uh, published. I'm also not aware where in what stage they are. But uh, I'm not really sure. Interestingly, while reading, I found that uh, IL-6 inhibition is also being tested in HIV. No, but uh, that I really, I don't think we should uh, <laughs> discuss it here like that. But IL-6 is not something which would be advisable. Yeah, but, no? yeah, the inhibition... <laughs> no. no, but I distinctly remember before I went to Delhi, that low-dose methotrexate, low-dose aspirin, low-dose um, of metformin, all of them were going into the trial stage. No, but I have not uh, read, and that was going more as anti-aging kind of thing. No? Anti-aging, there were quite a few trials about uh, reducing the chronic uh, low grade continuous inflammation uh, kind of things but we haven't read anything about it coming out uh... no but they must be in the ctri uh, nih clinical trial dot gov <laughs> this thing no? i haven't as i said no i'm sorry to ask this question i haven't read <laughs> so i don't know <laughs> no, certainly anything practice changing has not been published yeah yeah now, uh, maybe uh, the organizers, I would like to thank them because it is uh, past nine. We have, uh, I just cannot imagine how these two hours have just gone so rapidly. But uh, we are at the end, uh, we have almost finished two hours. So I would uh, hand over back to Nehru and uh, take the proceedings. I request everyone to stay safe and uh, hope that we all meet in person sometime. It has been a long time. All the panelists, thank you. Thank you, Manoj. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you, Vandra Kitka, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I think uh, it's a, one of the most exhaustive and uh, in-depth presentations covering uh, 
both the topics, whether it is uh, aging with HIV or uh, COVID uh, in HIV. It's a wonderful uh, presentation from our uh, faculty. So I thank uh, the moderator, uh, Dr. Vinay Kulkarni, for being there with us and uh, taking us through the sessions. And also we thank uh, the faculty, Dr. Ganga Ketkar, Dr. Sanjay Pujari, and uh, my friend uh, Manoj Pardesi. So thank you for uh, being with us and uh, making this uh, uh, sessions more lively and uh, interactive. Uh, this is the second consecutive year uh, we are doing uh, a program on uh, aging with HIV on uh, this long time HIV survivors day. And uh, in keeping in tune with it, we are going to bring in more uh, such sessions uh, uh, in the coming months or years. And uh, we are uh, sure that uh, this will be more interesting and uh, rewarding for the participants uh, as well. So with that, uh, I thank everybody once again. And uh, with this, uh, we'll uh, close this session. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Thank you.